Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That So Po, and today I'm joined by my husband, Sush. Hello. And we are going to be talking about the Hugo Awards short story finalists. So we are supporting members of the World Con, which gives out the Hugo Awards. So that means that we read the different stories and novellas and novels that are nominated as finalists and we vote in them. So today we're going to be talking about the six short story finalists and ranking them from number six, which is our lowest, up to number one, which is our highest. First up at number six, we have Badass Moms and the Zombie Apocalypse by Ray Carson. Um, so this story is kind of like a action horror story uh, set in a um, zombie apocalypse uh, scenario. And um, basically the fundamental uh, premise here is that the zombies here are very attracted towards human smells and in particular are very sensitive towards childbirth, which drives them into a frenzy. And this has an effect on the world that, you know, is portrayed here. So the world building actually is kind of neat in that the environment definitely has a character and draws you in. Uh, there's also definitely some amount of uh, modeling of uh, groups of women which are not in the typical uh, tank girl mold that you get in apocalyptic stories. So there's some of that that's, going, that's good for it in a sense. Um, but on the other hand, the characters felt a little one note for me. Uh, it kind of fit that idea where you watch a movie trailer and you think the movie is going to be good and then you notice that all of the good parts were in the trailer. And I felt that about the title, is that the story didn't do very much more from the premise in the sense. Um, there's also this notion of, uh, what do you say, some of the uh, decisions and solutions uh, that were explored in this book as a result of the way the world was set up didn't really follow through for me in that I felt like there could have been better solutions for some of those things. So in this book, while the premise was neat, didn't completely land for me. Yeah, and um, same for me. This is definitely my bottom story. It is something that is neat, again, in the premise, neat in some of the, the ideas and the centering of women and women's bodies and their choices about motherhood. Um, and those sorts of discussions are really cool, but I didn't feel like the story really delivered much past that initial idea. And it was so gross. I, you know, I really don't like body horror and this was filled with it. Um, and it was also filled with a lot of drama and kind of bad decision making. Um, and I just, I like, I really did not enjoy reading this story, um, which very much put it at the bottom of my list. Also, as a note, we are going through these ranked in my order. Sush's order is similar, but slightly different. At number five is Little Free Library by Naomi Kritzer. This is another one where the premise was interesting, but I just don't feel like it necessarily delivered that much. So the premise of this is that there is a person who creates a little free library out in front of their house, which is basically um, a little structure where you can put books and people can kind of take one, give one, etc. Um, and so they put out this little free library and they stock it with some of their extra books and people start taking books and there's some, you know, name dropping of books that they love and books that other people put in that they judge. Uh, and then one day somebody starts taking quite a few books and leaving some things in return. So it's a very cute story in a lot of ways, um, but I feel like it really relies way too heavily on the person reading this story being a lover of books. Um, Andrea at Infinite Text has a great video that I'm going to link below, which is actually a pretty big rant about how sometimes authors will rely so heavily on the idea of a person who loves books in place of actual, you know, character development or anything like that. And I felt like this really fell into that. It felt like fan service. It felt like just name dropping of books. And something that really got under my skin was that there was also a bit of book elitism, a bit of judgment on the part of the person who created the little free library about what books people should be reading and judgment of the books that they left behind. Um, and sort of, in a sense, this idea of sharing her knowledge with the people who pick up the books there. Um, it just it just kind of wasn't for me. So even though it was a little bit cute, I just didn't feel like it had much depth. It kind of relied on a couple of 
gimmicks in my opinion and the book elitism just didn't work for me and um this book was the bottom of my list and uh it's actually funny because as we were reading it the elitism thing uh kind of popped up and i try to normally say look it, maybe it's the character being elitist and maybe the author has something to say and then you wait and then you wait and then there's nothing on that end so it was no <laughs> And then at number four, we have Open House on Haunted Hill by John Wiswell. So uh, this is a very different kind of haunted house story where the, sto the house is aware of the question of what makes a home a home. The setting is one of an open house event set up by a realtor. And you get these little slices of things that you kind of expect or see in these kinds of events. And in particular, we look at a father-daughter pair who come looking at the house. So this story is utterly charming. I heavily recommend reading it. And basically it kind of centers notions of family and belonging and kind of wanting things for other people. And uh, it was just an utterly beautiful story that was charm. I loved it. Yeah, I think that this was one of those where you read it and you're just, you have a smile on your face. Um, I think that non-human narrators uh, are sometimes just so innocent and, and sweet in the way that they work. And this haunted house, despite being a haunted house, is one that has like really sweet intents. Um, and it's just such a fun story to read. I think for me, the story is at number four because all of the stories from here on are just so, so strong. And this one, while being so cute and just all about home and family, didn't necessarily have any of the bigger themes that appealed to me, but it's still such a strong, strong short story. At number three is Metal Like Blood in the Dark by T. Kingfisher. This is a sci-fi story that takes place on kind of a, a planet in a future where technology has advanced, um, but also there's a lot of resource scarcity. And on this planet, basically nobody lives there except for a man who creates a pair of robots, um, a brother and sister. And he's very worried about them because, you know, he doesn't know what's gonna happen when he passes away and how they're gonna take care of themselves. These robots are very good at scavenging for resources. They need a lot of metal and other resources in order to survive. Um, but one day when he finds himself falling ill, he tells them that they need to go um, further out into space and things like that. and. Uh, really find resources to make sure that they're okay, and they do so, but they also find an abandoned spaceship that is a great source of metal, except it's not actually abandoned. So this story is really, again, a sweet story. Um, this year's collection of short story nominees is, is filled with very kind of heartwarming stories. And this one about this brother and sister pair who are trying to get through some difficult situations. They're very innocent, very naive. They don't know much about things around them. And there's a lot of kind of nasty things out there in the universe. Um, the way that they have to change and the way that they look out for each other. And especially we're from the perspective of the sister the way that she's trying to make sure that she protects her brother and does whatever it is that is necessary for that and kind of her maturation and the way that she grows and the choices that she has to make sometimes rather difficult choices uh, are really really wonderful i think what's also very cool about this is this is written like a dark fairy tale and in fact if you read it i think you'll see which dark fairy tale it's sort of inspired by um and that fairy tale narration with also that kind of feel of of dark fantasy almost horror but in a sci-fi setting was just a very fun style so i really thoroughly enjoyed this one um and to kind of add to what you mentioned um there's a notion of there are stories of ai personhood and the notions of coming of age and this kind of neatly ties those aspects together it's it's really well done and then at number two, we have The Mermaid Astronaut by Yoon Ha Lee. And uh, speaking of themes of retelling of dark fairy tales, uh, as you can kind of make out from the title, this is kind of a retelling of The Little Mermaid. And, uh, but kind of uh, done in a way that is really interesting in terms of making it a sci-fi fantasy kind of a story. And you kind of see the Little Mermaid with a new set of eyes at that point of time and see that that is also very much a 
um, well, a sci-fi story in, in some senses. Um, it, it, this story kind of retells it in the framing of a sort of an immigrant story and uh, with also shades of some amount of trans experience kind of a feel to this. And I think uh, what I really liked about the story is that it not just normalizes or represents, but it really moves into the championing story. I mean, uh, kind of a, a style of story. And uh, the support system and the, what do you say, support modeling in particular of some of the interactions are brilliant over here. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. And so then it's like, it lets you kind of really live in the kind of, uh, what do you say, uh, fulfilling dreams narrative in a sense. But also as with The Little Mermaid, there's a notion of there is a cost. And so that cost is then explored in a very interesting kind of way. So overall, I think this is a very coherent story and I, I absolutely loved it. And I think that this is a story that is beautifully told. It's a very slow story that is very immersive for me. I was just very drawn into the world and the perspective of the mermaid as, you know, her dream is to go to the stars and to go explore space. Um, and just following that journey, her personal journey, and seeing those relations to like the immigrant experience. I love stories about immigration and about that sort of way that you have to deal with where you came from versus where you wanna go, what you have to give up, but what you gain and all of that kind of payoff as well as cost. It was just really beautiful, definitely made me cry. I was very, very moved by this story. And then at number one is A Guide for Working Breeds by Veena Jiamin Prasad. This is absolutely so fantastic. It really definitely is first place for me because I was thoroughly engaged in it and just it made me so happy. This is another very sweet story. So this is set in a, a sci-fi future that is a bit dystopian where robots are built in order to work kind of low wage menial jobs, um, but they do work jobs and they are assigned mentors. So older robots who can give them advice. And we follow a robot who is just newly built and dealing with some kind of difficult work situations, not really sure what to do, who is reaching out via chat to their mentor. And their mentor is an older robot who is a bit grumpy, doesn't really want to be a mentor, but reluctantly gives them some help. And this story, I loved so many things about it. So the first thing that I loved is I loved the formatting of it and the style. So the format is very much as a chat between these two robots, but also every once in a while things like records of, you know, sales records of things that are purchased, like you would get a confirmation email, that kind of thing. Um, and the way that this story is told, the difference in the speech styles and the kind of writing pattern within these chats with the two robots, their personalities come out so strong. The, the newer built robot is just very innocent and naive and excited about things and wants to be friends. And the grumpy robot is just so over it, doesn't want to deal with things, but is, you know, good at heart. Um, and the, the, the way that these two grow over the course of the story, I mean, anytime you have a short story that has this level of character growth of an actual like maturation arc um, and really just that kind of development of character, I think, is, is very impressive in a short story, especially when you've got such an interesting format to go along with it, but it's so effective. The world building is also so effective. I do not like info dumps, and this is the exact opposite of an info dump. It's something that just brings you into the world. It's very subtly done, and it's just you figure out what's going on. You understand this sort of dystopian, very capitalistic, um, it, very exploitative uh, world that they live in based on these interactions that they have of the newer robot asking for advice. And the key thing about this story is the messaging. I love the messaging. This is all about worker exploitation in a capitalistic society and these robot workers kind of coming together to support each other, to give advice, to help with resources. And it's all about that community and that support and the power of kind of unions and being together. It is just great messages, great characters, great world building, great style. I think this is just fantastic. I absolutely loved it.
and I don't know that I have that much more to add to that. Uh, one thing I will point out is a lot of the messages and events that happen in the story have a little bit of metadata associated with it. And it's like you can completely ignore the metadata and it's still a fantastic story. But those metadata pieces do a little bit of background world building and that's so beautifully done. Yeah, I think just the, the way that the world building is integrated into the story is so fantastic. And even just things like there's a lot of ways that language is used, the formatting, um, the naming. It's just so, so, so well done. I thought it was fantastic. Okay, so those are my rankings and our thoughts on the short stories that are finalists for the Hugos this year. We will be doing videos for some of the other categories that we're going to be reading and voting in, such as the novelettes and novellas and novels. Um, but if you guys have read any of these short stories, definitely let us know what you thought in the comments below. And most of these should be available for free online, so I will put those links in the description box. So anything that you guys have to share with us, any of these that you're interested in reading now, any comments at all, just leave them down below.